Okay, thank you very much. This is, this is a wonderful place to be. I, I thank everyone who's put this together and has taken the time to, to come here today. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I'm a very abstract guy. Uh, if the world were full of people like me, nothing would happen. Everything would be screwed up and everybody would start pretty quickly. Uh, fortunately, the world is not full of people like me who are abstract. Uh, it has many other kinds of people, and so I can occasionally be useful uh, because there is a place in the world for people who are abstract. Uh, I, unlike the, the first, the last two speakers, I, I do not have a great deal of direct service experience, uh, but to provide service as well it takes many different kinds of people. It takes somebody to fix the clogged toilets, takes somebody to clean the windows, and takes somebody to think abstract. So I'm like the window. Um, so today what I want to talk about is assessment. This is a new topic for me. Uh, my research here is not funded. Uh, by anybody, so I can say that everybody is responsible for it, rather than any disclaimers whatsoever. Um, I, I want to talk about this because I, I think it, I, I, because I'm so generally useless, I try to be useful occasionally. Uh, I also try to be entertaining. I usually get more successful at that. Um, the, I, I think, I can't tell you guys what to do as an, an abstract person from very far away. Um, but I, I think I can, like the window cleaner, shed some light on what you're doing uh, and try to make you think differently about assessment. A uh, guy tells me there's a lot of discussion of assessment going on. There's a lot of discussion in, in the United States. And I think I want to introduce some different ways of looking at things. This is new preliminary. I haven't done it before. I'm not sure how it will turn out. My hope is that it will make you think, uh, because that's what I, th I hope I can do. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to tell you what to do. So assessment is, is popular. I tells me it's popular here. It's, a, it's popular in the United States. Uh, it, it, it's because of cheap information processing. Uh, it's much, much easier to predict how things will act. Uh, all of us today go, go online to find out what the weather will be in the next hour. Uh, we use online dating to find out who our mates are. Uh, we look at polls and prediction markets. GPS tells us where and how to drive. Uh, this is all great. Uh, the less time and energy I have to spend on, on making decisions about my life, the better, because it's really very boring. Uh, the popularity of, of, of prediction, now though, has, has spilled over to, to NGOs and governments. Uh, we see prediction models being used to decide whose audits, whose taxes get voided. Uh, we see very much in the United States prison sentences and parole decisions being made on predictions. Uh, the Wisconsin case coming up, uh, Loomis versus Wisconsin. How long you go to prison in the United States does not depend on what crime you committed. It depends on a model, algorithm, usually proprietary and unknown, which predicts how long it will be before you get arrested for something else again. Uh, so the time that you spend in prison depends not on what you did, but on what we think you will do. Uh, marijuana arrests in New York City. Uh, how do I know that? Uh, marijuana arrests in New York City are very much tied to whether we think you'll, you'll commit a serious crime. 93% uh, of the people arrested for marijuana possession in New York City are male. Uh, police stops in many jurisdictions are, are based on what the police think you're doing. Uh, this is spreading throughout the world. In, in the U.S., this is not unpopular. In the U.S., there, there is an outcry that somehow the FBI cannot predict who the next terrorist will be, or who the Muslim community cannot predict who the next terrorist will be. It's expected now. 
predictions are made. Uh, and so this idea of predictions is in all business services too. Uh, my primary message today is, is to caution against this, especially the naive versions, but I'll explain what I mean by a naive version. Uh, I'm not against prediction. I use it all the time. It's useful, but it's dangerous. You have to be careful where you use it and when you use it. Uh, there are other tools that are available. A lot of what I want to do today is open your minds to different kinds of organizations that face the same problems that most services providers face and respond to them in different ways. The, the, the dialogue I've heard about assessment is very, very narrow. A lot of other people do different things. Um, and the, the, I, as Stefan is not afraid to be ethical about this, I'm not afraid to be ethical, especially because the, the, the DA is not paying. Um, <laughs> What, what do I mean about the naive model of prediction? I think it's what you see most of the time. It's the idea that you can take, observe the characteristics, some relatively stable characteristics of people. You write down what their characteristics are. You feed it to some algorithm. You have a bunch of services. The algorithm, with this information and this information alone, plugs the person in to the best service for that person in some sense, best socially, best overall. So you, you take these characteristics, you have this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful algorithm done by the most sophisticated people who will not tell you how they did it, uh, and then you get what you should do, what, the per what should happen to the person. That I take as the naive model of, of assessment and prediction, that's mainly what I want to talk against. Um, my problem here is not the use of algorithms. I like algorithms. I like mathematics. I like mathematics better than I like most people. Uh, human judgment is really, really bad. Uh, there's evidence for this in, in all kinds of places. The fact that, we're, that you're replacing human judgment with other aids is good. We need things to aid our judgment. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. Look at me, I'm wearing glasses. I need things to aid my vision. I would have been totally lost getting here without my glasses, and I probably would have tripped over things getting up. Where we use glasses and we're not ashamed of it, we should use things that help our judgment and shouldn't be ashamed of that. Uh, my arguments here are against reasonably good assessments. Summary, really four parts to my talk, explain each of them. First, the prediction is hard and it may be impossible. So the, the problem isn't that you don't have the right predictive tool yet, there is no right predictive tool yet. Uh, second, prediction doesn't lead to optimality. Doesn't tell you what to do not the right way to look at things. Third, optimality, you can get optimality in many other ways. Uh, fourth, optimality isn't what all you want. You want to think about fairness too. Um, first one, prediction is impossible. It may be impossible, and it's really hard. Uh, the naive prediction model may, in fact, be striving for a logical impossibility. Here, let me go to my first example, far from, from, from homeless services. I want to go to the world of finance. I'm an economist, I hang around with finance people, guys. Um, one of the basic ideas of financial economics uh, is that except for some anomalies, which are small, uh, price movements in a large liquid market are inherently unpredictable. Cannot be predicted. Uh, at least with regard to anything that, that I can tell you. Um, for, let me get quick. Suppose I found some interesting anomaly uh, that prices of airline stocks go up in October of leap years that are divisible by, 20, by 24 uh, when the weather in Melbourne is good. Uh, then if this became known, people would bid up airline stock prices in, just in September when this held, uh, and they would keep bidding them up until the anomaly disappeared. 
Um, so knowing something makes it false. Uh, this is the impossibility of prediction. People who tell you this, I think you know now that people who tell you that you, you should buy so-and-so stock are charlatans. People who may be telling you the same thing about homeless prediction may be charlatans too. Um, this is why I can't take the green claim assessment very seriously. This is, I've heard this many times, implied various ways, on, for instance, on prevention. If only we knew, if only we knew what people would become homeless next month, we could easily save millions and millions of dollars by giving them light services now and their lives would improve and everything would be wonderful. If only we knew. If only we knew what stocks would go up next week, we could, we could become fabulous and richer by investing in these stocks and not others. That's a if only we knew claim. If only the fire department knew what buildings would burn this afternoon, they could put their, their fire trucks outside and avoid the fires. If only we knew. If only we knew statements are fantasies, unless you could show that what you need to know is knowable. Um, does this apply to homelessness? It definitely applies to financial markets. I tend to think it applies to fire departments. You never, you don't see anybody, is there anybody working for the Melbourne Fire Brigade who's trying to predict which of the many buildings in, in Melbourne will burn this afternoon? No, there was a fire one. No. If you, if you came to them and said you were going to do this, they would throw you out. Uh, so why? Uh, people who are housed now become homeless not because of who they are, but because of something that happens to them. Why do I know that? Because who they are is who they were, and if it's only who they are, they would be not homeless now. You can only get a change coming about because of a change. It has to be some event. Um, just like fire buildings that weren't burning yesterday or that are burning today, something has to happen. Uh, if the people knew it was going to burn this afternoon, they would take precautions and it wouldn't burn. Fires happen only because they are unpredictable. Uh, entering homelessness in some ways is like a fire. So there, there are good reasons to suspect, I can't prove this, but there's good reason to suspect that, like fires, they're kind of unpredictable. We know generally where fires are, we know generally where people are, but the fire department doesn't go and try to make predictions. I understand what's predictable or not. So my first lesson is, you just can't predict everything. Uh, <coughs> macroeconomics went through this in the 1970s. Uh, if you look at what people were doing in macro in the 1960s, they developed these huge, huge, huge models to try to predict everything in the economy. It all came crashing down in the 1970s. If you want somebody who wants to know, predict what's happening in the economy, the Reserve Bank of Australia really, really has incredible resources. Just to predict a couple of numbers, they have more resources than any organization that you work for trying to provide homeless services. And I saw the statement that they released this month on what's going to happen. They said, yeah, something might happen. Let's wait and see. <coughs> that's where macro is, because that's where macro has learned to be. <coughs> Second, let's suppose you can predict. Prediction doesn't lead to optimality, not in, the, in any kind of simple model. Uh, Classic, basic economics. First thing I teach in principles is comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. Um, let me give you an example, which I, I want to come back to. It's very important. I, I think uh, there are lots of, of analogies here, and people have thought very, very seriously um, about cadaveric kidney de de uh, donations. Uh, these are donations from, from people who have died. Uh, there are large numbers of people who are waiting for, for, for these kidneys. Uh, and 
um, when a person dies who has agreed to, to donate the kidney, the kidney is in good shape, the question comes up in medical systems throughout the world, how do you deal with it? So this is a very clear question of triage, of sorting out resources that are limited and putting them to use in the best way. Does that sound familiar to homeless services providers? It's one also that's been studied a lot more and thought about, a lot more debate about. Uh, let me just go first. Cadaveric kidneys do not always go to the person with the highest problem. Kidneys differ very substantially and people differ very substantially. Uh, there are various kidneys match better with other people. Sometimes if you put, if you put the wrong kidney into the wrong person, it doesn't work. Uh, and there are degrees of good matches and bad matches. Um, the naive rule would be that you put, go, go to the kid, the kidney goes to the person with the highest probability of success. That is not the rule that any com country uses. First of all, it does not maximize the expected number of survivors. Um, why is that? Because maximizing the expected survivors require that the kidney goes to where it maximizes marginal survival, not average survival. Okay. Suppose we have two people. Uh, Mr. A and Mr. B. Um, if there are many, many kidneys out there in the world that are a good match for Mr. A, and very few that are a good match for Mr. B, then when a decent match for Mr. B turns up, even if it's not a good match, as good a match as that kidney would be for Mr. A, then it should go to Mr. B. Because otherwise Mr. B dies, but Mr. A has the chance with the kidney that is likely to turn up tomorrow. So the, the naive rule, if you're just doing maximizing the expected number of survivors, the naive rule is not the correct rule. So it's a complicated, dynamic programming problem, but best match is not the best rule. Uh, so what you know, even when you know who gains the most from being assigned to a particular activity, uh, you don't have enough information to know who should be assigned to that activity. You have to know the alternatives that are faced by those people. A very complicated process. It is not look here, look there. You have to, it's, okay? Assignment is a social process. It's not an individual process. That's what the, that's the next thing that we get going there. Um, Context means things in different societies. Uh, kidney allocation rules differ considerably. Uh, the, the rules in the United States are much different from the rules in Australia. Uh, the different states in Australia have different rules. I looked them up. Uh, they, the differences reflect differences in populations as well as, as judgments. Uh, because the U.S. is more genetically diverse, uh, more people are likely to have trouble matching, uh, and the U.S. puts less emphasis on match quality <coughs> than Australia does because the U.S. is much more genetically diverse. Uh, if the U.S. did, if the U.S. used the Australian rule, there would be a large increase in deaths of African Americans. Um, Different, so you can't import a system from the U.S. and expect it to work. Just as you did not import the U.S. system of kidney allocation. Okay, another area. So kidney prediction, kidneys. The next is, is racial profiling. A lot of work on racial profiling. Steve talked about Bernard Harcourt. Wrote another book, a much more philosophical book on, on prediction. Uh, Harcourt raises three objections to racial profiling. What is racial profiling? It's predicting who's going to do something based on racial information. It's a species of prediction. Uh, he talked about it in the legal context. I think these, these co go over to um, benefits as well as detriments, and so would, would apply to, to homelessness services as well. Uh, 
gives three arguments. I'm going to talk about the first argument here because it's an optimality argument. I'm going to talk about the second argument later. The third argument I don't think applies here. I don't understand it. Um, okay, here his example is what he calls and we call drywall contractors, but are really, to all you Australian guys, plasterboard installers. Okay. Dry, in the US it's known that drywall plasterers are more likely to cheat on their taxes than other people. Uh, so should the tax authorities ta audit them at a higher rate? Should you audit? Okay, another example. Okay, should you audit? Because it's known that these people cheat more, should you audit them more frequently? Notice that you're, this isn't racial profiling, it's the argument for racial profiling, but there, there, there's no, nothing in the U.S. Constitution against discrimination on the basis of being a drywall plasterer. Um, if the goal is to, to catch as many tax cheats as possible, then that's what you should do. So that's the naive response. If you want to keep, catch tax cheats, then audit the hell out of these people. However, that's not the real goal. The real goal is to minimize tax cheating. To minimize tax cheating, incentives matter. Uh, so what matters is how sensitive different groups are to the rate of auditing. Suppose that drywall installers cheat a lot, but they will cheat a lot no matter what you do, because that's the kind of people they are. They are fearless and brave, and you have to be to install drywall. Uh, on the other hand, uh, professors, they don't cheat a lot, but they're scared. Uh, they would cheat more if you audited more of them, and they would cheat less if you audited less of them. If there are a lot of professors and very few drywall contractors, then you should audit professors and not drywall <coughs> contractors, because that will scare them into compliance, and the major effect will be the scare of this big, big group the professors rather than the drywall contractors. So it's very easy to construct examples where what matters is how people respond, not the absolute numbers. Uh, I can give you examples of this in, in racial profiling. So there's no guarantee that going, that if you want to minimize tax cheating, if you want minimize, minimize um, the transport of contraband and racial profiling doesn't matter. What matters are these elasticities, these sensitivities, which we don't know. Um, so it doesn't, the, the naive things that you put into these prediction models don't necessarily work right. Uh, what about homelessness? I, can, I did this example where it's a, a A and B. I can show that it applies to homelessness. It takes too much time. I can come back. Um, so, one, you may not be able to predict. Two, prediction doesn't do what you want it to do. That's kind of down. Let me talk about some other things you can do. Uh, optimality comes from mechanism design, which I would call prediction, not um, partnership, not prediction. I talked about this late yesterday, so. Uh, I want to give you some positive results, okay? Because people have brains, program opportunities to program operators have opportunities to run their programs better, not by predicting with the information they gather, but by using the information that only participants have. Uh, you can treat participants more as partners and less as subjects, not because it sounds good, not because it's PC, but because otherwise you're screwed. Um, it's a, a subject of a technical paper that I gave with that Rosanna Scatella and Yi Peng Singh are, are co-authors. That was yesterday's talk. Got lots of nice pictures. Yesterday's talk. It can be done. Okay. Example. Another non-homeless example where you can see that people find out about other people. They find out useful information about other people, not by filling out, having them fill out questionnaires, but by giving them some rules and seeing how they act. Okay. Auctions. English auctions. Uh, Suppose I have a valuable painting, 
and all of you want to buy it. What I want to do is I want to find out who's willing to pay the most for this valuable painting that I have, right? Now, if you are in homeless services, I guess these days, the first reaction is I should, give, I should pass out a questionnaire, a very cleverly designed questionnaire, uh, ask you about your childhood experiences and age and things like that and where you went to school and then I'll get the questionnaires back uh, and I'll have a really, really smart person analyze them and tell me who is the person I should charge for the painting and how much they're willing to pay. That's what people are talking about in the assessment world, right? Uh, if I did that, would you think I was sane? What do people actually do? They don't do that. Instead, what they hold are auctions. Um, an auction, tell what goes on in an auction. You, everybody's seen auctions. You keep bidding until there's only one person left. Uh, notice what that does. It doesn't tell me about what your childhood was like. Uh, it tells me who the first, highest, and second highest bidders are. Uh, and it tells me approximately what the second highest bidder is willing to pay. And that is incredibly useful information, because that's what I want. I would like to get the first highest bidder <coughs> a willingness to pay, but I'll settle for the second highest bidder. It's a lot easier than the questionnaire. And that's what people actually do. They use auctions. The seller learns this just by setting the rules of the game and watching the, pet, the potential buyers play. Notice that I do not need a computer to do this. I do not need to make calculations. I do not need to buy a proprietary data set. You guys, tell me yourselves. Okay. The mechanism design is the branch of economics uh, that studies properties of games like this. How you get information from people when you want that information, rather than using questionnaires. Uh, it's a very hot uh, field. Uh, auctions were the first mechanisms uh, that were used. Uh, there's not much explicit mechanism design work in, economic, in, in homelessness. There's one paper that I wrote that nobody understands. Um, uh, but, in fact, uh, mechanism design has long been used in homeless services, although nobody has said it was. Uh, just as practical people invented auctions many millennia ago, uh, at least two millennia ago, uh, before economists discovered how nifty auctions were, auctions are really nifty, um, so too did practical people in homeless services invent good mechanisms for revealing private information a long time ago. Uh, example from yesterday is soup kitchens. Very old kind of thing, very low tech, very brilliant, just like auctions. Um, why don't churches and charities just give money to hungry people? Uh, one reason is that if you offer money, everybody will show up, because everybody likes money. Uh, but only hungry people will accept the, will show up and accept the offer if you offer traditional soup kitchen food. Uh, a church can find out who is hungry simply by offering food and seeing who shows up. Rich people do not show up in soup kitchens. Not because they will face a questionnaire that, find, that, that asks them how hungry they are, but because they don't want to go. Um, so this tradition is a wise tradition. Uh, and you should be proud of this tradition. You should take advantage of these old wise traditions, and you can do better. So is there a home mechanism design in homeless services? Yeah, it's been for eons. We just haven't recognized it. Pardon me? Okay. okay, fine. Oh, one more time, sorry. Uh, fairness counts as well as optimality. Uh, and fairness may be easier to achieve. Um, this is Harcourt's second argument against prediction. Um, the idea is that profiling 
whether it's racial or occupational, violates a fundamental principle of fairness, as Harcourt sees it. Uh, that the probability of punishment conditional on wrongdoing should not depend on irrelevant characteristics. I think that sounds right. I'm not totally convinced, but I think it's a, a reasonable principle to think about. Um, so if police stop cars that black people drive more often than they stop cars that white people drive, then if you're transporting contraband, uh, the probability of your being punished is greater if you're black than if you're white. So ex ante, the system is punishing you if you're black. That, I think, is the, the fundamental objection, the fundamental fairness objection to racial profiling in police stops. Um, if tax authorities audit drywall plasterers at a higher rate, uh, then an irrelevant characteristic, whether or not you're a drywall plasterer, uh, affects the probability that you'll be punished given that you cheat. If all the, the if, if, on, if tax authorities only audit drywall plasterers, then drywall plasterers who cheat are much more likely to be punished than professors who cheat. Um, as a result of this argument on fairness, our court recommended that tax audits and police stops be purely random. Um, I, don't, I haven't been able to quite accept that, but I think it's a very strong argument, and I think you should think very seriously about what that means. Um, does it apply to homeless services? Yes. Um, targeting ser services to people who have irrelevant but predictive characteristics is equivalent to targeting services away from people who don't have those characteristics. Uh, in the US, once you run these regressions, it implicitly uh, means targeting on the basis of race and gender, which is what the, um, the, 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 the prison algorithms do. Um, now, this is a, a principle of, fun, of, of fairness. It's not a principle of optimality. But I think fairness should count for something in homeless policy. At the end of the day, as, as Stefan has emphasized, uh, isn't concern for fairness what leads many of us and most voters to be concerned for homeless people? Not saving money uh, on these arguments. Um, so is self-selection or mechanisms different from targeting? I think possibly in some cases. Uh, I'm not totally convinced of this, but I know. Um, if Miss A shows up, up at a homelessness prevention office because she thinks it will help her, and Mr. B doesn't because of the opposite, it's not unfair that Miss A receives assistance and Mr. B doesn't. Uh, their assessments of their problems are relevant. I think what people think is going to happen to them, especially if it's well informed, uh, is a relevant consideration. Uh, but if Mr. B shows up and denied services because he's a man or because he's left-handed, and men are lefties are, are somewhat more unlikely in some data set to gain from homelessness prevention programs, then I think fairness is violated. Uh, so I think this is another argument for, for mechanism design rather than, than assessment. I'm not sure of it. I can give you examples where mechanism design I think will be unfair. Uh, but I think it's on, on the relevance of the criteria. Um, these are things I think that are worth talking about, what things are relevant, what things are not. Uh, if you read the, the Australian declarations on, on kidney uh, uh, transplants, it's very clear what Australia says is relevant and what is not relevant. And I think there's nothing equivalent to that on homelessness services, and I think there should be. Um, Lotteries. Uh, lotteries are a good way of dividing indivisible goods among people who are equivalent in all relevant dimensions. Notice the word relevant there. Um, like auctions and soup kitchens, uh, this is an ancient, clever way of doing things and an easy way of doing things. Uh, 
Lotteries work well to get fairness when you have people who are identical in relevant characteristics. The problems with fairness are deciding what, relevant, what characteristics are relevant, but you don't need great data sets to do that. And you, you, so uh, traditional techniques can be improved. Uh, they don't have to be discarded. Uh, notice that he, fairness is something that we know how to achieve. It's easy to be fair. It's really hard, for all the reasons that I gave before, to be optimal. Um, is there a trade-off between fairness and optimality? Yeah, probably. Um, there, if lotteries replace questionnaires in some cases, there may be more homeless people. Uh, if you don't make distinctions based on irrelevant characteristics, there may, in fact, be more homeless people. Um, Naive observers probably exaggerate the differences because I, for the first two slides, that this, this stuff that claims to be really good at predicting and really good at, at, at uh, assigning people probably is a fraud, um, but is not that strong. Um, just as naive observers of financial markets exaggerate the cost of picking stocks ran uh, randomly rather than deliberately, I think I have a better investment record than almost anybody, and I have never thought about anything for more than five minutes, I guess. Um, but fairness comes out of price. Uh, but as Stephanie, I, I didn't plan this that much. Good and important things come out of price. I think this price is small. Um, why fairness matters? Uh, because homeless people and people at risk of homelessness are distinct autonomous individuals. Uh, they're not pieces of a blob of general homelessness. Uh, they're not interchangeable. Uh, those of you who are service providers and have to look people in the face know that a lot better than I am. Um, if you look at the cadaveric kidney allocation procedures, which I, I have attached here, uh, <laughs> look at them. Um, people in Australia have thought very, very seriously about them. They are fought over, they're disagreed with. I don't know whether the, the, the Australian procedures are the right ones, but they, they are done very, very carefully, and there's a lot of wisdom there which you could get. The most inf interesting thing is that the first sentence on the Australian kidney allocation procedures says nothing about doing it right or doing it to maximize survival. The first sentence uses the key word in the first sentence of the Australian kidney allocation procedure is just. Uh, so, conclusion. There's more than one way to approach assessment problems. Want to expand your mind, okay? You look at the fire service, how they do. You look at kidney allocation. You look at auctions, you look at soup kitchens, you look at central banks. All these people face these problems and they've, they've done it different ways. There's a lot of wisdom out there in what they've done. Uh, the answers and weights are different in different societies. I can't tell you what to do. Uh, there are great philosophical, political, and technical debates about kidney allocation. There should be great philosophical debates about homeless focus. Information technology is a great, wonderful, wonderful tool. It's a tool. Uh, it's not a substitute for judgment. It's not a substitute for tackling the ethical and moral problems. Um, these problems are too important to be treated as a technical problem and left to people like me. Thank you.